So welcome everybody, welcome back. And uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tristan Ozu from uh, MIT. And he'll speak about non-collapse degeneration and desingularization of Einstein for manifolds. Tristan, I put you. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation. Um, so uh, yeah, today I'm gonna talk about Einstein four manifolds, uh, but in a different way um, than um, Antoine yesterday. So he talked about the collapsed situation and I'm gonna talk about the non-collapsed situation where there are still um, unanswered questions. And um, so yeah, I'll call uh, some, there will be some type of degeneration in this setting. And we will see that the opposite is the desingularization. Um, yeah, so let's start. Um, okay, so an Einstein metric has constant Ricci curvature. So that's already uh, a nice enough uh, equation for, um, you know, the, I mean, that motivates uh, the study of these metrics. But my very favorite way to motivate them in dimension four is that um, they minimize the L2 norm of the curvature whenever they exist on a given manifold. So there, there is a strong link between Einstein metrics and the topology. Uh, the underlying topology. So um, the L2 norm of the curvature by uh, churn gosbonic formula decomposes into two pieces. One is purely topological, it's uh, the other characteristic, and the other part is non-negative and vanishes exactly on Einstein metrics. So I, I like Einstein metrics because they minimize this energy and there is a very nice topological geometric uh, formula. Okay, so we have uh, a nice <laughs> Um, equation, the Einstein equation, and we want to understand the set of solutions to the equation. And uh, noticing that the equation is invariant by two uh, trivial actions, by reparameterization and rescaling, we define the moduli space um, of Einstein metrics, which is the set of Einstein metrics, modulo these two actions, um, modulo uh, rescaling by fixing the volume equal to one, where uh, Antoine was fixing the sectional curvature um, between minus one and one, um, and uh, and also uh, quotienting by the diffeomorphism group, uh, which uh, reparameterizes uh, the the uh, the manifold. So in this space, the natural distance is gram uh, of distance, and um, as often when we are studying um, moduli space, there are uh, um, natural questions, which are uh, what are the global properties of this moduli space. Um, and here we will see that there are several types of degenerations. And so the question becomes, uh, can we compactify it? Um, and uh, with some structure maybe to understand the um, Einstein metrics from, uh, the, from the global properties of the moduli space. And also the moduli space is a topological quantity. It only depends on the manifold here. So this might give some information about the, the manifold itself. Okay, so there are degenerations and you've seen with Antoine that there are uh, collapsing degenerations. So take just in dimension two, this already appears. Just take a torus and uh, fix the volume equal to one and let one of the length go to infinity. Well, you end up with something with infinite diameter, but which is one uh, dimension uh, below. Uh, you can also find a uh, cusp um, in a hyperbolic geometry. And again, uh, this appears with um, infinite diameter, and this already appears in dimension two. Um, so in dimension four, <clears throat> the situation is a bit more complicated, but there is also a compactification in the gram of Hausdorff sense. So it's been done by um, several people that you can see here. Um, and this uh, compactification here has three pieces. So the first one is just our smooth matrix. So nothing um, new here. The second part, which is not well understood here, I won't talk about it today, uh, but this is not well understood. This is the, the limit of collapsing and cusps uh, formation. This is, this is um, similar to the two dimensional situation, but this is not well understood in dimension four. But today I'm gonna focus on this last piece, which is what we call uh, the singular Einstein matrix. And they can be as bad as just Einstein or bifolds. I'm gonna tell you what this is uh, right after. And so we will only focus on, on this piece here, which is uh, the metric completion with the, the gram of Hausdorff metric of the moduli space. So we won't give a structure to the compactification, but only the completion for now. 
Okay, so what are these uh, singular spaces? They are um, Einstein orbifolds, and this is not so bad. They are smooth everywhere except at a finite number of points. And um, these singularities are, again, not so bad because they are just quotient of the Euclidean space and they just look like with only one singularity and they look like uh, the cone uh, on the top uh, left here. In order to construct examples of such metrics, just take some uh, quotients of your um, symmetric metrics. So take the Poincaré disk, for instance, and uh, an antipodal identification, and you'll find uh, an orbifold singularity here of the type R4 mod, mod Z2 or mod plus minus. And you can do the same um, on your sphere, just on the cross section, and you'll find uh, what we call the American football metric with two singularities. You can also do the same on your uh, flat torus, and you'll find um, an orbifold with 16 singularities. So in dimension two, there are only four of them. Uh, this is your pillowcase metric, but in, in higher dimension, this is a bit more complicated. So singularities are really not so bad, and the analysis is exactly the same as on a um, smooth metric. Um, now, the next step is understanding how these singularities appear. Well, they appear by blowdowns of uh, some bubbles, and the bubbles of the problem here are Ricci flat ALE metrics. So they are Ricci flat, and they are asymptotic to one of the cones um, I mentioned. So uh, the, the bubbles, the infinity of the bubbles and the singularities coincide, and I mean, that's, uh, that's how uh, they, um, I mean, that's the link between the, the, the blowdown and the singularity which forms. And the way um, these singularities form is, um, is really simple. It's just a rescaling, essentially. And the simplest example of this Ricci flat ALE metric is the Aggression zone metric. It's Ricci flat and asymptotic to this simplest cone I already mentioned a few times. So how do we create a singularity? Well, just take your metric, multiply it by a small factor t here, and let this factor go to 0. That's just a rescaling. And by definition, by letting uh, t go to 0, just by definition of the asymptotic cone, you converge to the cone. And you created here a singularity. And every singularity really um, appears that way. So it's, it's not so bad, uh, but that's how, um, that's how they appear. And more generally, you may have singularities appearing on top of each other. So here you have a singularity, a bubble, with other bubbles uh, appearing on top of it. You may have several singularities at once. Uh, but that's um, the analysis is always localized, and so it, it's not um, a problem for us. And let me mention that um, the, maybe the main challenge, the biggest question in all of this uh, study, and also in the study of Ricci flows, as you will see with um, uh, Richard Bamler, I think it's today, um, is understanding these Ricci flat ALE metrics uh, because they model the, the singularities and from them we can understand uh, Einstein metrics and Ricci flows much better. The only known examples are quotient of hyperkeller metrics called uh, gravitational instantons. And a long standing question is whether or not this is the, the complete list. Okay, so now I'm gonna <clears throat> um, just give you a list of questions and, and answers, uh, just to to um, to give a, a plan for the rest of the talk. Um, and so what we've seen so far is that a limit of bound the bounded limit uh, of uh, of Einstein metrics is an Einstein orbifold. And the natural question is the the the, the converse: Are all Einstein orbifolds limit? of uh, Einstein metrics. And if you reword it, it becomes, can we desingularize every single Einstein orbifold? That would be um, our question here, and that's a, 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 an old question. And um, this year, I finally answered it. <clears throat> and well, this simplest orbifold I presented to you, this uh, American football metric, cannot be desingularized by smooth Einstein metrics. That's maybe the newest result I, I present today. And um, what's maybe striking is that this space is Einstein in a synthetic sense, in neighbor's sense, for instance. But it cannot be um, approximated by smooth Einstein metrics. And so, um, yeah, the, the same kind of, um, of result in the RCD um, 
situation would be uh, amazing. Uh, the Einstein equation is, is, is um, quite um, different, but that's um, also one, one way to see, uh, to interpret this result. Okay, so we cannot desingularize everything. Um, so the next question is, what can we desingularize? So <clears throat> in the asymptotically hyperbolic setting, uh, what can be desingularized is quite well understood um, by uh, by Bicar. and um, essentially uh, this becomes much easier because you have a conformal infinity. And I mean, you can send your problems to infinity in some sense, and and the problem is purely local. Now the next step is to understand the, the same question, but in the compact setting, and let's say what can we desingularize by just a Gaussian matrix that's the first um, question and um, i'm going to answer by another question which is well does it impose reduced holonomy do we do, does the the orbifold in the limit have to be keller einstein in order for the uh, desingularization to have any any chance to to um, to be uh, to work um, and here, the, this needs a second order version of, a, uh, of, um, of Bicard's result. And the, this is very different because the problem is global here. And let me mention that even if we were able to solve this question, this would not be the end of the story because even in the keller einstein setting, um, there are obstructions which are very different in nature, uh, but that we, already, that we also do not really understand. Okay, so that's the desingularization um, question, but there is also another thing on, on which these desingularizations um, give some um, information, and that's the structure of the moduli space near its boundary. So the, just the structure of this completion. So um, the first one is a convergence result. The convergence is not only just a, a, a gram of of convergence, it's C infinity in some weighting sense. So it's a very strong convergence that will let us um, do some, uh, use some techniques from analysis, uh, while uh, gram of of would not let us uh, understand anything. Um, another important result, probably the most important here, uh, is that every single Einstein metric, which is gram of Hausdorff clause, so again, a, a, a clause in a very weak sense, can be um, can be produced in, by a somewhat um, explicit procedure, which is a gluing perturbation procedure. So we can reconstruct every single Einstein metric as long as, as it is a gram of Hausdorff clause to an orbitfold. And this also gives some structure to the moduli space. It's the zero set of a C1 function on a C1 submanifold of metrics. And this C1 submanifold has uh, its dimension only bounded by a function of the diameter and the Euler characteristic. Uh, and maybe you can replace the Euler characteristic by lower bound on, on the scalar curvature um, in dimension four. And that uh, extends, in, in some sense, the um, result of Gallo, which also required some bounds on the sectional curvatures. Uh, another question, which I think is a really um, uh, exciting is to understand the size of this uh, singular set here in order to understand better the, the topology of the moduli space. And the question of Anderson is whether or not this set of Einstein, uh, of singular metrics is of co-dimension two. And well, I, I, I show that this should be true. Uh, this is true up to second order if the bubbles are Egusianson. Okay, so that's my list of uh, questions and kind of uh, answers. Somewhat, uh, so just like this one, there are not always um, complete answers, but that's uh, what we have so far. And let me start uh, by uh, the beginning, the, how do we go from Gromov-Hazov to a smooth convergence? Um, so <clears throat> first, how, how do we uh, desingularize an Einstein metric? Well, by gluing perturbation. So take a Ricci flat Halley metric, an orbifold, and assume that they have the same uh, asymptotic cone. Take, your, take a small parameter and multiply your rich flat metric by it. Well, you end up with two metrics which are close to a cone here. And in particular, you can identify some annulus in which um, the two metrics are really close to, to each other. And then you can just 
um, glue the two metrics together uh, by using a cutoff function on this green region. So this is very uh, uh, a completely dumb way to, to glue the two metrics. If I asked you to, to do it um, in the simplest way, you would have done uh, exactly the same thing. So it's very um, a very naive way, and I even call these uh, desingularizations naive. And I'll denote them uh, GDT for uh, desingularization. And now we have our gluing. The question now is, uh, can we perturb it to an Einstein metric? And this is always the much harder step. And um, understanding you know, the perturbation means understanding in which function space we want to do that. So usually in, in, in gluing perturbation, people uh, create function spaces in order to, to, to be able to do this perturbation. Here we have a, a different goal. Our goal is to, um, to, to find uh, how close our Einstein metrics are and, and to use um, function spaces which are modeled on this closeness. So we have uh, the, a different problem. And so our which function space question is not in which, in which function space will we be able to do the perturbation? It is in which function space do we actually have um, closeness? And this has been answered by uh, this first uh, theorem. So take an orbifold and now take an Einstein metric which is close to the orbifold in a gram of Hausdorff sense. So that's the weakest assumption you can, uh, you can make. Um, then there exists a, uh, a naive desingularization, MGDT, so that the Einstein metric is not only gram of Hausdorff close, but it's close in some weighted holder sense, in a very strong sense here. So our naive desingularizations are not so naive. They are actually good approximations of actual Einstein metrics. So what are uh, these uh, weighted norms? Well, they look like this. So when you have, so here you have a natural um, norm on, on cones, but here you have a weight and that's this uh, G of R and understanding the norm means understanding this weight. And well, being bounded for this weighted norm means being less than the function, at least in a, in a C0 sense. And so uh, what is this function? Well, it looks like this. It's just one on your large compact of the orbifold and of the, um, the bubbles. But in the neck regions, which link the bubble and the, the orbifold, so in this neck region, you, you actually have a decay here, a polynomial decay even. So you are, you are not asking for a convergence speed on these large parts, but you are asking for a convergence speed in, in the neck region. That's very different from the usual norms coming from gluing perturbation, where um, the typical norm is uh, like this one above used by Bika, for instance. And what's very different is that it asks for a convergence speed on the orbital part. And it's usually not satisfied. I mean, it's almost never satisfied. And so we gain something by just uh, uh, not asking this. And uh, so something which is even more important for us is that this new norm handles uh, several singularities, but also um, trees of singularities. You can handle uh, singularities appearing on top of each other by just asking a decay on each neck region. And so the way uh, we prove it, so on the white regions here, the, the metrics are just Einstein metrics with uh, bounded with um, a harmonic radius bounded below. And so by just epsilon regularity, the two metrics are close to each other. So my Einstein metric here is always close to its, uh, to its blow ups. So it's close to the, the orbital metric on the white region here. It's close to all of these uh, bubbles rescaled on the other white regions. So the white regions are fine. We, we are done on, on these regions. And so the whole difficulty is really these neck regions. How do we uh, deal with uh, these AK, AJ, AL? And how do we relate them to the green regions here? And in, in, in darker green is the gluing region in where, in, in where the, the, the metrics were um, uh, cut off uh, to, to each other. Um, and so you see that there are several parameters in the gluing and they look like this.
So the way um, the, the, these next regions are bad because you have arbitrarily uh, uh, different smaller and, and, and larger radii in these regions. And so all of these epsilon regularity theorems uh, give you nothing. They just give an error that blows up. And so my idea was to use, um, to co construct some new coordinates in these regions by some CMC foliation. And what's great about them is that their intrinsic and extrinsic geometry is purely controlled by the ambient curvature. So you obtain really uh, optimal control of them. And, um, and so this ambient curvature was controlled by Bando, where he had exactly uh, the, 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 the type of uh, control I needed. And this, um, and this makes me uh, construct optimal coordinates whose uh, spheres are these uh, CMC hypersurfaces, so constant mean curvature hypersurfaces. And they are optimal by just the fact that the, the intrinsic and extrinsic geometry here is controlled by the ambient curvature. And in particular, we get a control like this for the metric, which was the expected control. So that's the, the, roughly the, the steps in order to, to, to find a, a, a better convergence. So every Einstein metric, which is close to an orbifold, is a perturbation of a naive gluing. Let's now look at the converse. Let's take a naive gluing and let's try to perturb it to an Einstein metric. And that's um, the next theorem, that's a partial converse. So let's take um, a, a naive gluing with a small enough parameter. That's what we want to approximate. We want to approximate something which is close to, to, um, to an R before. I think there is a question. What do I mean by optimal coordinate? I, I mean that the control of the metric in the coordinates is as good as it gets. So um, the, the metric is as close as a Euclidean metric as the, the curvature is small. So you cannot expect your uh, metric to be closer than that because the, the curvature is there. So I mean, thank you. Um, okay, so now let's take any naive glu gluing with small enough parameter. Well, we cannot perturb it to an Einstein metric, and that's the whole point. Um, often, we cannot perturb it to an Einstein metric, but what we can always do is perturb it to an Einstein modulo abstraction metric. So this is not solving the Einstein equation, which would be just this equal to zero. We solve it up to some explicit set, which I call the abstractions, and which you want to think of as the co kernel of the linearization of uh, the Einstein equation. So that's um, quite uh, typical. You cannot always, you, if you have some, um, if you are not surjective, then you cannot solve your equation. That, and that's exactly what's happening here. So um, at this point, uh, we are not really happy. We have not constructed Einstein metrics. And, uh, and yeah, no one should care about these metrics. They are not geometrically motivated or uh, anything like this. They are just, um, yeah, they just come from an analysis problem. And uh, at this point, we, do not really care about them, but what makes them interesting is that they reach every single Einstein uh, desingularization. So we have constructed every single Einstein metric. Uh, the question now is, when does this equal zero? And when it does, we have exactly uh, an Einstein metric. And so we have, cons we have constructed, we have reconstructed a whole neighborhood in a grammar first of sense of the moduli space, uh, close to, to, to one of these uh, orbifolds. So that's why these metrics G hat T are useful. They are just whenever the obstructions vanish, they are Einstein metrics. And you see here that my C1 function of which the moduli space is zero is this um, O hat T, that's my C1 function. And the G hat are my submanifold um, in, in which uh, the, the, we, we want to find the, the zeros, which are exactly the, the, the moduli space. Okay, so now, um, yeah, sorry, um, let me come back here for one second. So that's, that equation here is my obstruction. Whenever it, it cannot be satisfied, then you cannot find any Einstein metric here. So when the equation O hat not is equal to zero cannot be satisfied, you cannot find any Einstein metric. And that's my obstruction result. And uh, first uh, application, is that if you take a sequence of Einstein metrics, 
converging to an orbifold, but with a, a given topology, which is the topology um, of the desingularization by gravitational instantons, or their quotients, then you find an obstruction, which um, is that the kernel of your self dual part of the curvature is at least one dimensional. So you need to have a zero in your curvature uh, for the gluing to make any sense. Um, so this is an actual obstruction because this is not satisfied by S4 mod Z2 or H4 mod Z2. And let me note that this was already identified by Bicar under technical assumptions on the orbit fold that I will mention later. Um, and assuming that there are equations and metrics and, <clears throat> and more, um, and something which was more disappointing, which is that he had to uh, assume a convergence in weighted holder spaces. Uh, but this convergence is usually not satisfied. So um, that, that was the reason for my whole KG, which I did uh, under his supervision. He wanted me to go from um, this weighted all the space to, I mean, from Gromov-Hausdorff to some uh, nice space. And that was our first theorem. And so we, here we get a, a general abstraction result in which you can have uh, deformations for your orbital, as many singularities as you want, and trees of singularities forming the obstruction which will still hold. So some example of application. So you may want to try to desingularize this um, American football metric by gluing two Egusians and metrics at, at, at the two singularities. But the theorem tells you that it's impossible. You cannot perturb it to an Einstein metric. What you can do is perturb it to something which has pinched Ricci curvature in an LP sense and maybe some bound on the Ricci curvature if you want. And that's fine, you, you can do it, uh, but you cannot have the exact quality. And an, an open question for people interested could be to, to try to do the same thing with L infinity instead of LP. And I, I don't know what should be the answer. Um, so this was an abstraction under some topological assumption. Another assumption that you can make is that you are spin. And again, for your right singularities, you will find the abstraction. But here, um, this year, I have a, a new result, which is that um, the abstraction is general and does not require any topological assumption for a spherical and hyperbolic uh, orbifold with uh, singularities like this. So for instance, your um, American football metric cannot be limit of smooth Einstein metrics. It's impossible to approach it in a gromov hausdorff sense by smooth Einstein metrics. And so I want to, to spend some time just uh, giving you some, some ideas um, which motivated this, um, uh, I mean, we, which are parts of the proof of it, but maybe not direct parts of it, but which I think um, are useful in other settings. So let me just give you some formulas and, and, and results. Mm. Okay, so <clears throat> it starts with the question of integrability of Einstein deformations. So take an Einstein metric. So we say that uh, an infinitesimal Einstein deformation is just a deformation so that the, the Einstein equation is satisfied at a linear level. That's the, just the linearization of the equation. And we say that this um, deformation is integrable when it's the actual first um, derivative of a, of a curve of Einstein metrics. So integrability implies uh, clearly the infinitesimal, uh, the fact that you're in infinitesimal deformation, but the opposite is not always true. And that's a very delicate question. So, <clears throat> okay, so one of the main tools, I, I think it's, uh, it, it's um, very simple, but very uh, useful, at least uh, it was useful for me, is that you, uh, so I, I will relate it to this question of integrability right after, but we have nice formulas by uh, integration by parts, essentially just your um, divergence theorem. So just take T divergence free and divergence free is our assumption here. And that's always what's important in all of these proofs. Then you have two formulas, um, two just um, integration by parts formulas. And the second one is really similar to Shane's Bohozaev identity for a scalar curvature. Um, so for um, Shane's Bohozaev um, identity, just replace T by um, Ricci minus uh, the scalar curvature over two times the metric, that's divergence-free. 
and you find a uh, chain's formula here. And what's important here is that if if x is killing, then here you have just zero. And if here the trace is constant, and if uh, you have a conformal killing vector field, then here you also have a zero uh, right hand side. Conformal killing. And here the trace of t is constant. So for instance, if we take this uh, example of a chain, t, uh, tr the trace of t, sorry, is uh, a multiple of the scalar curvature. And an Einstein metric has constant scalar curvature. So this should vanish. And this will vanish if you take a conformal killing vector field. So that's, uh, these are very simple formulas, but they are um, uh, very deep. And they have some, uh, some, some information. And, and, some, and this term will be important for us as well. So what's the link with um, integrability? So let me take E of G to be the tensor I mentioned, which is divergence free. And um, a very simple result is that if G is Einstein, then any, any linearization of this tensor is divergence free. So you can directly use your, um, your uh, divergence theorem to this tensor, the linearization in the direction H. And if you have a killing vector field, which kills the right, hand side, you will find this identity for any hypersurface and any killing vector field and any two symmetric two tensor H, you have this vanishing, uh, you have the vanishing of this quantity. And the idea is quite simple. Uh, take um, sigma here, uh, perturb it a little to sigma prime and take a cutoff function, um, say, which is um, like this. So to say that this is one in the neighborhood of sigma and zero after sigma prime and multiply um, uh, H by this um, factor. Then in the previous formula, this uh, boundary term is, is only seeing the, the sigma part because that's where uh, there is some mass because of the cutoff. And so this integral here is just equal to uh, the whole boundary term which is zero because we have a killing vector field. So the right-hand side um, in the previous formula, let me just uh, show it again, here vanishes. So you have just this thing equal to zero. That's a very um, simple proof, but that's a deep result. Uh, let me mention that that was done in the Lorentz Cyan setting, and I'm um, extending it to the Riemannian setting with exactly the same proof, and I, I will give you some other extension of this. Okay, so what's so here so far there is no link with um, in in uh, integrability of uh, infinitesimal deformation. So what's the link? Well, it's here. If you assume that you have an infinitesimal deformation, then the second derivative is divergence free. And <clears throat> So you define what's called um, Taub's preserved quantity in, 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 in Lorentzian geometry. And that's this same integral, but with the second derivative here. So it's invariant, it has a lot of good properties. And what's great and what's um, a deep result is that if H is integrable and say Ricci flat, we won't need that um, in the Riemannian setting, but that's what they proved then you have this vanishing. And this vanishing is not always satisfied. There are obstructions to integrability and they are exactly these ones. So there is a, a beautiful result by uh, Fischer, Marsden, Moncrief, and you should add um, Judith Arm, Arms as well in this list of names. And, and these are the only obstructions to integrability of Lorentzian um, Ricci flat metrics. So if you have a Lorentzian um, Ricci flat metric, and if you take an infinitesimal deformation which satisfies this, this uh, equality, then there is an actual curve of Einstein metrics. That's uh, uh, an amazing result, and, but it uses a lot of, um, of this uh, hyperbolic nature of the, the Einstein equation in Lorentzian setting. So we cannot do it in the Riemannian setting so, so easily. And the idea in order to prove this is again very simple. Just take your metric uh, up to other three and differentiate the equation E of G of T is zero. And you end up with uh, this uh, thing here. And, and if you just uh, integrate this over sigma and apply it to 
y and uh, and your normal then you find um this identity here and and this right hand side is zero by the first uh, theorem the first proposition uh, oh sorry that's not the h here that should be k sorry that's k here that's your k that you find here so we have a nice abstraction to integrability so let me uh, so i prove uh, i wanted to extend it to the um, integrability of uh, of deformations of a Ricci flat cones. So let's take a Ricci flat cone, looks like this, and it is Ricci flat. Well, there are very similar uh, obstructions, but this time they are on the Ricci, uh, the traceless part of the Ricci curvature. Um, and they hold for both the your um, conformal killing vector field RDR and and uh, any killing vector field of um, of GS. Let me see. here. Um, so yeah, you have these very similar abstractions in the other setting that was E here, but if you want to allow um, Einstein deformation and not only Ricci flat deformations, then you need some assumptions and then you can uh, use uh, the traceless uh, part of the Ricci curvature instead of um, the Einstein tensor. So we have abstractions to integrability of deformations of Ricci flat cones. And what's important for us is that they are equal to many obstructions that we have for to the desingularization of Einstein metrics. So take a sequence of Einstein metric converging to an orbitfold. And let's assume that um, a rescaling of it converges to a given Ricci flat Ailey metric. So that's our general situation. But let's uh, use these uh, notations. And let's assume that our two metrics have some um, some um, some first, uh, some expansion. So the first term is the same on both sides, but then there is a H2 and H4, which is the next term in the expansion. So here, this is an expansion at the singular point and here at infinity. Then there are obstructions to the desingularizations, which look exactly like our obstructions to the, the, um, the integrability. And these are obstructions to the integrability of H4 plus H2 if you think of it, because this is a quadratic form here. And uh, these two were already integrable because just of the existence of GB and G naught. So we can rewrite many obstructions to the desingularization as such uh, an integral. And that's quite satisfying to see the second derivative of Ricci uh, as an abstraction. And that way you, you recover every obstruction to the desingularization by Egusianson metrics, for instance. Okay, so that's uh, one new way which is um, useful to to find uh, obstructions. So let me let me uh, give a few ideas of how from this you can prove that uh, S four mod Z two cannot be desingularized. <clears throat> so let's take a, a non-flat, not flat is important here, rich flat Ailey metric. But if you take a blow up, it will not be flat if you take the right blow up. So the first two, the first tool and which is uh, very important for us is uh, Bicar and Hein renormalized volume. So whenever you have a Ricci flat Ailey metric, you can define a renormalized volume. It is negative, uh, and I mean it's non-positive and, and zero exactly on flat cones. And if you take a non-flat Ricci flat Ailey orbital, then it will be negative. Thanks to the previous formula, you can rewrite the obstruction as um, the, your, uh, okay, so let's take a metric, sorry, or an orbifold, which has lambda as a Ricci curvature and which has zero veil curvature, just like the sphere, just like your hyperbolic metric. Then the first obstruction um, against one of the deformations of the Ricci flat Ailey cone is lambda times this volume. And so if this is not zero, then, uh, and if the, the volume is also not zero, I mean, it is all, never zero, sorry. Then there is an obstruction. And that means that there is an obstruction that you, the, to, to this um, gluing perturbation. But there is one additional difficulty that, I, I, that is hidden here, which is the fact that the Ricci flat Ailey metric might have non-integrable deformations. So um, these obstructions to the integrability could compensate these obstruction 
to the desingularization. These are very different in nature, I mean, in, in what causes them, but they can compensate each other. And that's, that was um, the main problem remaining. And so we want now to understand these obstructions to the integrability of rich flat ALE deformations. And uh, I want to motivate the, the fact that, um, I mean, we, they, uh, what we want to prove is that these obstructions cannot compensate the previous obstructions. And let me just mention quickly a few, um, a few steps of this proof. The first one is that you can take any conformal King vector field of your asymptotic cone and you can extend them to um, harmonic uh, vector fields. Then the traceless part of the, um, of the lead derivative of the metric in this direction is traceless divergence three, and of course uh, an infinitesimal Einstein deformation, but it's not a trivial an infinitesimal deformation. It doesn't come from um, diffeomorphism or something. It's, a, it's an actual deformation. And if you go a bit further, then the obstructions to integrability are of the form an integral of T against the traceless part of this um, uh, lead derivative. And T is divergence three. Uh, so uh, according to Shane's Posey formula, I mean, the, the, it's uh, maybe slight uh, generalization. Uh, this is equal to, uh, sorry, to some limit when R goes to infinity of uh, some boundary term uh, of, on the sphere uh, SR. And this boundary term is zero just because things decay fast enough at infinity. And so you prove that these obstructions vanish or are small enough so that they cannot compensate the previous obstruction. And so we, we've used these um, integration by parts uh, techniques a few times and they are uh, very useful in this setting. I think that um, uh, Alex Doriel and, and Felix Schulz are using similar techniques in the case of gradients um, um, expanding solitons. And I, I think that these formulas can be useful in many different settings. So I wanted to spend some time on them. Okay, so that's <clears throat> our, we cannot desingularize everything uh, step. Let's now uh, go a bit further and, and and try to understand what we can desingularize. So we are going to the higher order abstractions and namely uh, second order abstractions here. So we're gonna take the same assumptions as Bika, but only assume a gramma first of conversion because we can now. <clears throat> so let's take a compact orifold. Compact is very important for us. Rigid, just like in Bika's situation and assume that there is only one singularity of the simplest type. Now, Let's also assume that we have um, uh, an orbifold, which is limit of Einstein matrix on the topology of M not desingularized by uh, a Negusianson metric. That's the, the topology of a Negusianson metric here. Then there is an additional obstruction. So the first obstruction was that this dimension is at least one. Well, here we prove that it's at least two. Um, so it's okay. That's better, that's a stronger abstraction. But what's maybe um, uh, the most important here is that this is exactly the type of curvature you find in the Keller-Einstein setting. So this is this uh, type of curvature is typical of Keller-Einstein metrics. And so our question, so that's since um, the curvature can be seen as a um, infinitesimal version of the holonomy, uh, you can say that uh, at some first order you are, um, you're actually like a keller einstein metric. Um, there are stronger results in the Ricci flat setting and even more in the stable Ricci flat setting, semi-stable um, for some people. Um, so I, I, I say that um, a metric is um, semi-stable or stable if the linearization has only a non-negative uh, spectrum on traceless tra transverse tensors. Uh, that means that if you run the Ricci flow, then it will flow back to your metric, for instance. Um, but I allow um, Ricci flat deformations by uh, non-negative spectrum. There can be zeros here. So let me take again a flat, uh, a Ricci flat compact manifold, desingularized by a bunch of um, Egusianson metrics here. You can have many of them. And let's assume that there is a, a sequence of stable Ricci flat metrics converging to it. Then 
we have the same obstruction, the, the curvature, the cell dual part of the curvature is just vanishing at the singular point. It's important to know that it's only at the singular point at this step that this is true. Okay, so that's a higher order obstruction. Um, let me mention that it's not true in the in the non-compact setting, in the asymptotically hyperbolic setting, this is not true. There is a counterexample uh, constructed by Page and Pope. Um, the idea is to, to take, uh, I mean, just this family called uh, ADS top bolt. It, has, it satisfies all of our assumptions, but the curvature only has a one dimensional um, uh, kernel here. So it's not uh, satisfying our, um, our second order obstruction. And so the, the, the interpretation is that this second, I mean, this second order obstruction really uses the compact nature of, um, of, of our matrix. And we cannot send our problems to infinity like you can in the asymptotically hyperbolic setting. So this, is, this uh, shows that this second order obstruction is not local, it's a global question. Okay, so <clears throat> now um, this uh, opens more questions than it answers. Um, but let's let's mention two of these questions. So let's take a Ritchie flat orbifold and desingularize it by a Gaussian matrix. And the first two obstructions, at least when it's stable, mean that you have um, cell, uh, an anti-cell dual curvature at the singular points. But you also have an infinite list of obstructions which uh, which are on the higher derivatives of your curvature. And my question is: Well, does it impose that this um, that this uh, cell dual part of the curvature vanishes exactly. And if so, that would show um, that your limit have to be um, locally hyperkeller. That would be the very long-term question. Um, maybe, maybe, I don't want to call it a conjecture as this step, but um, if you have a limit of a rich flat matrix bubbling out a Gaussian matrix, does it have to be hyperkeller? That would be uh, the question here. And this is true up to second order by the previous theorem. Another theorem, uh, another question, sorry, that we partially answer is this question of Anderson saying that the singular set is of co-dimension two. So first, this is false in the asymptotically hyperbolic setting with the same um, um, counterexample. And this can be uh, rewritten as there exists, I mean, just the same conjecture with other words, that there exist uh, the singularizations which are uh, transverse or, um, or orthogonal to, to, the, to the boundary of the moduli space. And what, what, we, what I showed is that this second order obstruction is a, is a second order version of Anderson's conjecture. And moreover, every element of this kernel here um, coincides with a uh, Einstein desingularization up to second order. Okay, so let's now test these higher order obstructions in uh, some example, which is T4 mod Z2, which is uh, of interest. So let's take D4, T4 mod Z2 that I defined uh, before, and let's glue a Gaussian matrix to it. So we want to glue rescale the Gaussian matrix, but we also want to to rotate them before gluing. So we apply some uh, element of O4 before uh, gluing. And so if the, uh, the gluing is done in the positive orientation, then the obstructions are, are on R plus, and if not, they are on R minus. So the orientation is important for us. Okay, so why is it a, an important example? Well, it's because um, Page and Gibbons Pope gave a, a picture of what should be a, um, hyperkeller metric on K3 by taking this orbifold and desingularize it by um, by 16 Egusianson metrics, but in the same orientation. They are all in SO4 here. So if you do that, well, it's been proven by uh, mathematicians that you can perturb the naive gluing to a Ricci flat and even hyperkeller metric here. Okay, so we created a hyperkeller metric on a rich, um, um, but a, a very important question in geometry is whether or not they are compact, maybe stable, rich flat metrics which are not hyperkeller or locally hyperkeller. Um, that's one of the biggest questions in uh, differential geometry. 
um, other compact three flats for manifolds with generic holonomy. So Page has a candidate for that. It's probably the best candidate at the moment, uh, which is to take the same orbifold, but this time glue a Gaussian matrix in different orientations. And the question is, well, can we perturb it? And if so, this would yield a stable or not richly flat metric with generic holonomy. So that's a gluing perturbation problem that people are uh, very interested in because that would answer this uh, question. <clears throat> so let me talk about this uh, singularization. So first you have to decide where you put positive and negative orientation uh, of your gluings. There are a lot of possibilities, but then you also still have 57 degrees of freedom. So it's a 57 uh, dimensional space and nine of them come from the flat torus and the rest uh, come from uh, three times 16 um, uh, deformations of the uh, of the Egusian sun matrix. My result is that, so we had 57 degrees of freedom. Well, we also have 57 polynomial equations to satisfy. So um, yeah, in, in general, just to have a rich flat desingularization, you need 57, you have 57 obstructions to satisfy. And if you, add the term uh, stable, then it's 84 obstructions. So there are many more obstructions than there are degrees of freedom. And this indicates that, I mean, almost all flat metrics should not be desingularized, um, at least when, uh, when you choose uh, the right, um, the right, uh, the, the right um, positive and negative orientations. And the idea is just to consider the, the partial hypercalar desingularization and try to perturb this partial desingularization to a total desingularization. And there are obstructions to doing so. And when they are not satisfied, then you cannot do the desingularization. That's where all of these obstructions come from. Um, maybe more, um, an, an, another type of, uh, I mean, a true type of obstruction under only topological assumption is that you cannot desingularize the regular uh, torus coming from the usual Z4 lattice by one Egusian sun metric and uh, in one orientation and 15 in the other. If you add the word stable, it's even worse. You cannot do it with uh, at, at most three and at least uh, the, the rest of negatively oriented um, Egusian sun metrics. <clears throat> so um, yeah, so th this was already studied by uh, Brendler and, and Capuleas where they construct, they use this uh, regular torus, a chessboard pattern for the positive and negative orientations. And what's um, important is that they used, they have only a one, per, one uh, parameter family because there is only one parameter here, T, which is the scale of all of the Egusian sun metrics. And they proved that there is one obstruction and it was used to, to construct a very, very important and very new uh, type of Ricci flow, an ancient solution of a Ricci flow, which desingularizes the, the orbital. That's a, a striking um, construction. And this comes from our abstractions. And let me note that in this configuration, none of the 57 abstractions is satisfied. So, okay, at this, time, at this point, you would you would think that uh, nothing can be desingularized. But um, I found a family, 14 dimensional one, it's probably much larger, um, of, of desingularization of this regular torus, which because of its, um, of its symmetries um, can be, I mean, can be, cannot, I, I don't know if it can be desingularized by rich flat elementary, but, but, but it can be uh, desingularized uh, while satisfying the 84 abstractions. And so the question would be, well, can we desingularize it by actual rich flat metrics? And I think this should not be true. I think higher order, even higher order abstractions should prevent this, but this is very hard to check. And so that's our, my last um, slide of results. And let me just uh, conclude by quickly uh, recalling what, uh, what we did today. So, the, the, so uh, I'm going to do it uh, chronologi chronologically. So um, in my uh, first papers uh, of 
PhD thesis, um, I proved that first the Gromov-Hausdorff neighborhood of the set of singular metrics um, is described in a smooth sense and not only in a Gromov-Hausdorff sense. And then this let me um, uh, this let me extend this obstruction that Vicar found to the conjecturally um, general situation. So we only so most important part is that we only had to assume a Gromov-Hausdorff convergence, but we also could handle any type of orbifold, any gravitational instanton instead of just Egusianson, and we could allow uh, several singularities and trees of singularities. But this is the, 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 the cornerstone of, of the rest. It's probably the, the most important result in, in the list. Then um, last year in December, um, I, I proved these results of higher order obstructions. And uh, this motivates questions rather than it answers uh, completely uh, some questions. Uh, the first one is, well, do we have this second order obstruction for any uh, Einstein metric desingularized by uh, gravitational instantons? So I, I proved it under technical assumptions with Egusian and um, with other gravitational instantons. It's not so different, but uh, there is some difference. Um, that's the first question, probably, probably doable. Uh, the second one is uh, much further away. Uh, it's understanding, it's a, it's a long-term question. And that's, well, if your bubbles are gravitational instantons, well, is your limit Keller-Einstein? That, uh, that's the, the long-term question. And there is your, this question of Anderson, which is um, whether or not the boundary should be thought of as a boundary or actually a, a feeling of missing pieces. So is it a, a co-dimension two subset or not? And the last one is this question of desingularizing uh, T4 mod Z2 by Ricci flat, but not hyperkeller metrics. So that's uh, the result from uh, last year. And this year, um, I used the analogy between uh, desingularization and integrability of deformations. And, um, and this uh, let us uh, recover many obstructions from conformal killing vector field of the cone. So in, in your neck regions, what's happening is that your um, Einstein metrics, which are desingularizing an orbifold, are really a perturbation of a flat cone. They look like, uh, they, I mean, the neck regions at very small scale really looks like a flat cone. And so our Einstein metric is a perturbation of that and there is a, is a deformation of it. And the question is whether or not this is integrable. And so th there is a link between integrability of these deformations and obstructions to desingularization. And that's what we use here, um, looking at conformal King vector fields uh, of the cone. And the main application was the fact that you cannot desingularize uh, spherical and hyperbolic uh, orbifolds with uh, R4 mod Z2 singularities. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tristan, for this uh, very precise account of results. So are there any questions? Yeah, Felix is a... Uh, so there are questions in the chat and Felix uh, online. So Felix, please start and then we'll answer the question in the chat. Okay. Um, so yeah, very nice, great results. Um, you mentioned this result of Brendle and Capuleas. Yeah. How does this fit fit in with your obstructions? You said this was completely obstructed, that problem, but they still found the Ricci flow. Can you explain a bit sort of how this connects? Sure. Um, yeah, let me come back to, to it. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, um, so how do we find a, a Ricci flow is a bit um, um, complicated here, uh, but let me, let me try. To, to say something. So the obstructions when you are gluing, um, so, the, so the obstructions are really um, elements of the kernel of the, uh, of the um, linearization of Einstein for Egusianson. And what's, um, what's important to note is that they look like, um, so um, there is this O1 obstruction, which is in the kernel of the linearization of the Egusianson metric here. And O1 is, really equal to um, this traceless part of the lead derivative of, um, here you have your Egusianson metric. Uh, 
And that's exactly how you want to write your abstraction. Mm -hmm. And here, x is close to uh, or dr at, at infinity. So can I understand this? So this is in some sense, you see the, the, the force which is, which is opening up the, the gucci hansen metric as the obstruction? Exactly. So what you are, so solving the equation modulo abstraction gives you um, that the Ricci of your, um, say your um, Einstein metric, uh, maybe here it should not be Einstein, but that your, um, uh, your um, Ricci flow is equal to some um, lambda of t, some, some constant depending of ti uh, on time, times uh, this O1. And if you look closely, this looks like, I mean, this is a, a multiple of the metric plus some Hessian plus some Hessian of a function. So that's at first order, your metric is really like a soliton. So it's really, and, and you see your Egusians, the perturbation of your Egusians metric is not Ricci flat, it's not Einstein, but it's close to being um, a soliton instead. Is it clear which soliton you see? Yeah, because O1 here, um, this is uh, lambda times t times, uh, I don't remember the numbers, but I think this is uh, two times g e h plus the hessian of some function okay uh with respect to g h so the, the that's here it's not the true ricci curvature that would be the the linearization of uh, of the ricci curvature at, uh, at the agushians and metric for uh, g t minus g e h but at the first order you really see a soliton this means if you, if you take the flow and you do a, for, a blow up forward in time you see an expanding soliton at each of these at each of these, these, I guess not really. Yeah, not really because it takes it the time. Yeah, exactly. So if you blow up, you will just see the Agushian sun metric, but at the next order, you see something which behaves like a soliton. Oh, I see, I see, okay. And maybe one, one little uh, technical question. When you look at, uh, at these um, Einstein Orbi faults, which you get, and you, you desingularize them, do you also get Einstein Orbi faults where you converge to the, to the to the cone at the at the orbifold point slowly, or do you always have a polynomial decay rate? Uh, do you mean with a Ricci flow or a, no? Just 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 static. You know, when you when you knew, I just was wondering if, if do you have this case that you have Einstein orbifolds where the where you have more or less non-integrable tangent cones at the orbifold points, or do you are they always integrable? So do you always get a good decay rate to the cone? Um, I mean, yeah, no, the the cone is always. Uh, Quite. I mean, you, you really have a um, an expansion of your metric as the cone plus something. Okay. Which so, is so you don't you don't get like in you know you don't get like if you have singular like like singularities in minimal surfaces where you have like flow convergence to the tangent. You don't have this. So you have always no. put. It, okay. I was just wondering because you had this decay rates, and I was wondering if you have to deal with the with these mm -hmm. much worse decay rates where you yeah okay cool great thank you so much. More questions? Okay, so there's nothing in the case that people have questions to ask. So thank you again, uh, Tristan, for this beautiful lecture. Merci beaucoup et bon voyage. Ah, there is a question in the chat. Sorry, it was no, no, there's no question. Thank you very much. This is a question. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks a lot for this lecture and uh, see you soon, uh, Tristan.